Good evening, Levine Baptist Church. Welcome. It is Sunday night. We're back in the house of the Lord. What a great place to be. I was thinking when I was walking out of church this morning, wow, I'm not getting obliterated with the heat. I didn't have to roll down my car windows when I pulled up here to try and I love this time of the year. What to open up this morning with a, or this morning, ha. Huh. See where I'm still at? This evening with a, a passage from First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 15, 16, 17, and 18. See to it that no one repays evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, in listening to what, what the pastor was preaching on this morning and, and over the last couple of weeks, that passage kept coming back to my mind where God says, don't do this, and that's always a bad place to leave somebody. And then he says, here's, here's stuff to fill your time. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything. And then he doesn't say this is a suggestion. He says, this is God's will for you. This is one of those things when I like when I'm doing some of my counseling, people say, if God would just tell me what to do, I said, well, let's open up the First Thessalonians chapter 5, shall we? And here's what God says God's will for you is to do those things. But what a positive way to live. Kind of begin what Pastor was talking about this morning. What would the community look like if 250 people going to Levine Baptist Church looked that way when they were at Fry's and Walmart and getting gas, it would, it would be an amazing testimony. But that's what God's will for us is, folks. So let's worship the God that gave us clear and precise directions on how we should live. Amen. Let's uh, stand and uh, worship the Lord. I mean, we're, we're alive. We have many reasons to be grateful for him. Amen. The Cowboys won. The Packers lost. And it will be great weather. Amen. Announcements for us. You can take a seat. Let's see. Here we go. Hey, if you know Catherine Erickson, uh, Ren, Katie, she goes by a few names. Uh, make sure that you encourage her. She's got a bridal shower coming up. 
So this is, I guess, just for ladies, because I don't want to have anything to do with a bridal shower. Uh, but so ladies, uh, October the 16th, I don't think men are invited to those things. So I think that's okay with me. Uh, anyway, uh, October the 16th, uh, here on campus, they're going to be throwing her a bridal shower. So make sure you know about that. Um, we still need tons of candy. Uh, we need, still need tons of volunteers for uh, Harvest Festival. And so if you have the opportunity, uh, we'll... Lots you can, of candy. Yeah, I hear you there. Lots and lots of candy. Hey, but it's starting to fill up, so that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah, once. Yeah. Once? It is it 15? To, it needs to be 15 15. Times. There it is. Still yeah. 15. All right. So uh, make sure that you sign up uh, if you're available that night. Uh, what an amazing opportunity. Uh, some people choose to stay home and, and do the trick-or-treating thing and uh, talk to people in their neighborhood. Hey, I get that. But there's around, I don't know, usually around five to 700 people uh, that come through here. And so your odds are a lot better of talking to people and spending more time with people and sharing the truth with people here than at home. That's just my little plug anyway uh it's a great opportunity uh this whole little grassy section if you've never been here gets transformed and there's tons of opportunities for them to be able to play games and get candy and while you're playing games with them you're building relationships with them and opportunities to share the truth of jesus and so hey walls are already broken down because there's food and candy and, and so we have great is, food trucks coming too. Yes, hey. Papooses is coming. Yeah, and, and one more. And um, Fatheads. Yeah. Barbecue. And, and that's our oh, very yeah. own Keith Charmison. And so Keith Charmison is going to bring his food truck, his barbecue food truck down. And oh man, it's, it's going to be good. So there you go. Hey, Ladies Fellowship Night coming up soon. Uh, that's this weekend, this Friday. Uh, so talk to Miss Donnell uh, and bring your favorite dish. Uh, Hallelujah Hymn Sing this Saturday. Andy, you got anything for that? This coming Saturday at 2 o'clock, going to pull out our hymnals, going to sing a whole slew of hymns. Whole slew and there's going to be some, some special music as well. Now, I've been in a few slews. That's, a, that's, that's quite yeah, a bit Yeah, that's a slew. All right, there you go. I shot a lot of animals in a couple slews. But anyway, we won't shoot any animals at this one. We're going to have a great time, though. Hey, uh, let's see. Is the power in the blood, is that one going to be there? Can we get like a preview of some of them? Oh, I imagine, yeah. Oh, hey, all right, there you go. Man, I might just come just because of that one. No, I'm going to come anyway. But hey, Women on Mission, Live an Evangelistic Lifestyle. Uh, Women on Mission, it'll be here on campus. Live an Evangelistic Lifestyle is not this weekend, but next weekend. This weekend, be praying for our men as they head up to uh, men's retreat. And then next week, next weekend, uh, all church uh, is invited uh, and encouraged to be able to come uh, to learn about uh, living an evangelistic lifestyle from uh, uh, Pastor Jerry Larson. Uh, surviving the holidays coming up with Grief Share. Grief Share is going on right now. Marriage and family Sunday school class starting new. And then, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, there you go. All right. Hey, chicken enchiladas. Don't want to miss that uh, on Wednesday. Let's see. Here we go. Where was I at? One more thing. I forgot to add this. Uh, for those of you who helped with Workday, thank you so much for coming out uh, and helping get projects done around. Why don't you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for what you do, God, how you're, um, you're constantly at work in our life. Lord, um, as, as we sang this morning, uh, sometimes we just don't see it, though. We don't see your work. We, we kind of are wondering, but we know, God, in those moments where we just don't understand, we know that you have a plan, you have a purpose, and you are still working despite what our feelings tell us, despite what the world tells us, despite what our situation tells us, you are still working for our good and for your glory. God, help us to constantly be reminded of that. We're thankful for this opportunity today uh, to be able to come out again, to be able to hear your word proclaimed, uh, to sing forth, declare forth your praise, and to encourage one another to love and good deeds. We're thankful, God, for this opportunity. We pray that you continue to bless it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the 
Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is
as Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to come this evening, Lord, to be able to hear your word, to be able to worship you, Lord. And so, like I like I say, Lord, just continue to prepare our minds, speak through our past, Lord Jesus, and just great messages that you've been providing, Lord, and, uh, that we may just put in our daily lives every single morning, every single day. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. If you want to remain standing for a few moments, in the honor of the reading of God's word, Jonah. Chapter 1, I'm going to read through the first 10 verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish against away from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What are you... What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us and he that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. You may be seated. Always has been, as I've said before, one of my favorite stories growing up. I never did quite understand how it happened, but you know, in the young in a young person's mind, a child's mind, if you read this story to them, it can just uh, give you all kinds of pictures in your mind about what that must have been like. Jonah sitting inside that fish, and uh, you know, the smell, all those things you consider. But it was always a fascinating story to me. This evening, we're going to take a look at this prophet named Jonah. We're going to do that for the next few weeks. Growing up with this story of Jonah the, and the big fish was for me always a fascinating event to get to hear it. It's a unique picture in that while other prophets prophesied against Gentile nations, Jonah is the only case of a prophet actually being sent to a foreign nation to deliver God's message to or or against them. Jonah, chapter 1, 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came, uh, the the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. Now he's telling him to go to a very wicked place, an evil place. And uh, Jonah, as we know, um, he wasn't real, um, real high on that. He really didn't want to do this, and so he decided not to. 
Jonah wants nothing to do with God's instruction. Verses 2 and 3, we read, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah is trying to do a very foolish thing. He can't do it. He thinks he can get away from God. He can, uh, if he can just get far enough in that boat, get in that boat and head on over to the other side and go to a different place, that God would not be able to find him. Um, he doesn't want to go, so at this point Jonah decides, as we just read, to go, to a, go a different direction. Jonah was going away from the presence of the Lord, is what he thought. Uh, that's an impossible thing to do, by the way. You cannot get away from the presence of the Lord. Um, this illustration that God gives us here in Jonah's life is one we who are believers need to understand. This should never be the way we respond to God's direction. When God gives us direction, the best thing you can do is get there as quick as you can and get busy doing what God said to do. We have so many illustrations in Scripture where God's um, prophets, uh, other people, God told them to do something, and they decide, no, nah, it's not for me. I'm going to go the other direction. And um, it's just a foolish thing for believers to do. Uh, we need to respond and, uh, to God's direction in the right way. Jonah rose to flee. It's like he thinks he can remove himself from the presence of the Lord. Um, he's wanting to do that because then he could do things his way. That's his mindset. Um, we do that a lot. I, I, would, I would venture to say that there are a few people, at least tonight here, that may be doing that running thing. We're going to get far enough away from God so he can't, you know... <laughs> reach out and discipline us or something. I, you know, it's like we think we can get away with things. With God, you can't. He sees it all. He's, um, he's omnipresent. He is present everywhere. He knows all. He's omniscient. He, he knows everything. Before you get ready to pray, he knows what you're going to talk to him about. You know, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great comfort because we serve this God who is able to do all of these things. Uh, it probably bothers us sometimes when we're doing the wrong thing and we think about that uh, issue that he, he knows all. He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking right now. Oh, come on, preacher. He doesn't know. Yes, he does. Uh, he, and he knows what you're thinking. So I hope you're having good thoughts right now. Um. It's an illustration, is, uh, is this illustration is one we who are believers need to understand. This should never be the way we respond to God's direction. Jonah rose to get away as far as he could. It's like he thinks he can remove himself from the presence of the Lord. And then he can do things his way. The difficulty with Jonah's thought process is that his God, who is the, the God he serves... The God of Scripture is both omnipresent, omniscient. He is, eventually, he is essentially everywhere at once. He has a perfect knowledge. He knows all. He also is omnipotent. He has absolute power over all. But as we see Jonah thinks he can, even, you know, even knowing this, Jonah thinks he's able to, uh, as verse 3 says, uh, to us, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah is totally wasting his time. He cannot get away from the presence of the Lord. Sometimes we would like to. Um, you know, maybe something we've done, it may be, um, you know, that bothers us and we haven't settled that with God yet. And, or it may be something like Jonah. He wants us to go do something. That's not what I want to do. 
Um, and I don't know if you ever get that way. Um, I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> uh, but don't try to get away from him to settle that. You cannot do that. I think most of you know that. But he rose to flee. He thinks he can remove himself from the presence of the Lord. Um, the difficulty with Jonah's thought process is that his God, the God who he serves, the God of Scripture, uh, knows all, sees all, is in all places at once. He is essentially everywhere at once. He has perfect knowledge. He knows all. He is also omnipotent. He has absolute power over all. So we waste our time totally trying to get away from God. But as we see, Jonah thinks he is able to do, as verse 3 tells us. Now, Jonah has been told by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is possibly the largest city in the world at that time. I feel for him in this, in that he may have been just a little bit um, overwhelmed. Uh, it is a, is a very large city possibly even the largest in the world at that time. Nineveh, with a population approaching about 600,000 at that time. Jonah may very well be a bit in, intimidated at, at this point. God wants him to do what we read in verse 2, Jonah chapter 1. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. That way he could maybe get out of going to Nineveh. God told him to cry out against the great city of Nineveh. Now, that would probably be a little bit intimidating for most of us. Go to a town of 600,000 and begin to cry against them. What did that mean? Tell them about their sin. Um, help them to understand that they're lost. They need the Lord for him to forgive that sin. That could be a little intimidating in a town, of, in a, in a town where you have 600,000 people and you are the only one that's crying against the sin. Um, I don't know how many of us would go. Some may end up on that ship trying to get... The other direction, that's what he did. He thought he could do that and get away from God. Um, call out against this great city of Nineveh, telling them their evil has come up before God. You know, if you tell somebody they're evil, or you talk about their evil practice, uh, what happens? Have you, have you made an instant friend? No, not usually. Uh, people don't like to be told that. They just don't. I, I mean, I don't know. I have never really understand it, understood it really well. If they are evil people, and they know they're evil people, maybe they don't, and you tell them they are. Um, I don't know. If they don't want to be an evil person, they would want to listen, I guess. But these folks didn't want to listen. They, they were not happy with Jonah telling them that they were evil people. Jonah, however, was not interested at all with God's instruction. He was, however, interested in getting out of town. Um, that, that's what Jonah was thinking about. He said, I, I have to get out of town. A foolish thing to think when God tells you to go do something. Jonah 1 and verse 3, he got up to run, thinking that somehow this would be okay, especially if he could get to Tarshish, he had the mistaken idea that he could get away from the presence of the Lord. I don't know how he came up with that. Now, he didn't have a Bible sitting in front of him. I get that. Um, but to think that you could get out of the presence of the Lord, if you are a believer, uh, just seems like a, a pretty hard thing to do. But, but we do that from time to time, don't we? Ever had a time in your life when you kind of got away from the Lord and all of a sudden it was six months later and you hadn't been to church in six months? Any of you ever have that maybe? You don't want to raise your hand. Okay, I see one hand. Yeah, there's two. 
you know, there, there are hands to be raised in the, in the group here um, with that particular question. Um, Jonah is kind of doing that. He wants to get away. He doesn't want to be around where people tell him what the Lord wants him to do or where he might hear what the Lord wants him to do. Um, but the Lord is fixing to help Jonah understand. But he, he left. Um, when God says um, he's, he's going to try to help him understand here, that when God says to go to Nineveh and cry out against it, the best thing to do is get there quickly and cry out against the city of Nineveh with a loud voice. Sometimes God's children do it like Jonah did it. He goes down to the shipyard, he gets to the ship, he pays the fare, and goes down into the ship headed for Tarshish. The, the thing that always fascinates me about this story is where he was when they went to look for him. Down at the bottom of the ship, and he was sleeping. Now these are not uh, ocean liners. The, these are those old rickety wooden things they used to put together. And uh, there had to be so much noise, you know, with that thing squeaking and all those joints and everything in that ship. And uh, he went down, down inside the ship, laid down, and went to sleep. Um, but he wasn't doing the best thing he, he should have been doing, which was uh, headed for Nineveh. Uh, he didn't want to cry out against the Ninevites, but sometimes God's children do it like Jonah did. He gets in the ship, pays the fare, goes down into the ship headed for Tarshish, thinking he's headed away from the presence of the Lord. Now he does something here that he goes down and he goes to sleep. Uh, I don't know about you, I have a hard time going to sleep when I know things aren't right with the Lord. I don't know about you. But uh, if I get in bed and I'm going to go to sleep and, and maybe something's happened that day, Cheryl yelled at me or something, you know, and I got, no, she never yells at me. Um, no, but let's say you have a little tiff with your wife or your husband and you go to bed. I, I know none of you guys have ever done this, but you go to bed and, and it's not settled. Um, you know... You probably roll around a little bit and you think, oh, I gotta, you know, just roll over and pat her and say, honey, you know, I love you. And, and uh, we, we, you know, I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. You know, one of those things. It's very easy to do, but sometimes there's a little bit of pride in here sometimes. Do you ever, I mean, do you ever experience that? You want her to roll over and tell you, I blew it today. <laughs> no, I don't care. But Jonah, knowing what he needed to do, went the other way. 1, 5, and 6. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo. This is Jonah in the ship. The ship is about to sink. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship had laid down and was fast asleep. That I don't understand. That, in my mind, has always been something God might have helped him do because in one of those old ships and it's bouncing around out there in that water, um, I, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't have ever slept in that. I, I need a quiet place and a nice bed to sleep. And if, if I was bouncing around in the bottom of that thing, I don't know where he, he went down into the, inside of the ship and laid down and went to sleep. The wind was so strong that the ship was in danger of breaking up. That's how much power was in that storm. Um, God, according to Jonah 1.4, he hurled, I love the way this is written, Found a ship. Let me see, verse 4. And the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. That picture of God hurling a great wind upon the sea, um, it's a comfort to know that our God is great enough to do that kind of a thing. That's a pretty big order to get uh, that big storm going on out there. 
but there was a great wind hurled upon the sea, um, and the ship was in danger of breaking up. It was such a strong wind that the sailors were afraid. Each of them were crying out to their gods, that's little g-gods. They also began to throw their cargo overboard to lighten the ship so they wouldn't sink. But notice old Jonah. He's uh, having quite the nap. The mariners were afraid. Each cried out to his god and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, laid down, and was fast asleep. I I always, when I'm reading this, and I see these guys going through all of this, and um, the the difference in what happens when they speak to their God, and the difference in us speaking to our God. There are results when we, we pray. Um, in the case of those others, they, they don't have anything. I think of that often when I read uh, scripture that talks about this. Um, I don't know why someone would be a member of a false religion. I don't understand that. Because their prayers don't get answered. They don't have the comfort that God gives to believers uh, we have a, we, we understand who our God is as believers. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason ever, uh, you know, to be discouraged or all of those things. He tells us in scripture there is not because he is in charge of what's going on. However, people who worship false gods, they're, you know, they're, they're very adamant sometimes in praying to their gods. These guys, they were down there praying to their gods. But their gods could not do anything because they don't have any gods. They just think they're praying to somebody. Um, it's, when we pray to God, He hears us. He's there. Um, no telling where their supposed gods are. But they also begin to throw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Notice Jonah. He's sound asleep. The captain has apparently heard what is going on. Verse 5, perhaps he sees the sailors crying out to their gods, throwing the cargo over the side of the ship. I'm sure the captain didn't appreciate that a whole lot, uh, although it was probably something that had to be done if they were going to keep the ship up. and They all stay alive. But uh, he's... He's responsible for that cargo. And here they are throwing the cargo over the side of the ship uh, into the sea. Jonah, however, was fast asleep there in the inner part of the ship. How he did that, I don't know. I don't think I could sleep in one of those old rickety, you know, noisy boats that had to squeak terribly if they were going through a storm. And, uh, you know, just flopping around. Uh, I don't think I I could have gone to sleep, but Jonah seemed to be, um, you know, he was sound asleep down there. Um, And in Jonah verse 6, the captain, he gets a little peeved with Jonah. So the captain came and said to him, he found him fast asleep there on the inside the ship. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, perhaps... The God, the God, will give a thought to us that we may perish. That we may not perish. Um, He's kind of upset with Jonah because Jonah's sleeping. He's not up running around with everybody else. And then he's not praying to his God. Um, The fishermen don't really know what to do, but in verse 7 we See, they conclude with uh, what they would do to find things out. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast the lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So what do those men believe about Jonah? It's his fault. He's the one that's responsible for all this. What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, get up, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us 
that we may not perish. Fishermen conclude that they need to cast lots so they might determine who is responsible for this evil that has come upon them. Casting of the lots. One writer says that casting of the lots was really a last resort used to determine whose guilt has caused such a divine anger to affect the entire crew. Well, the exact method of the casting of lots is not known, nor was it forbidden in Israel. It didn't appear to be something that was forbidden uh, for those who might know uh, the one true God. But what we do know from Scripture is the lot fell on Jonah. Then the questions arise. The questions from those on the ship with Jonah, of which there are There are five questions. They're all seen here in verse 8. They really condensed it there. They were probably wanting to get it done quickly. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? That's what they wanted to know from Jonah. Because he seemed to be... um, He wasn't acting like everybody else. He was sleeping in the bottom of the ship, while everybody else was probably upstairs and downstairs trying to work to keep themselves afloat. Jonah 1, 9 through 16, we see the conclusion (coughs) of this rather unique event. Read that, 9 through 16. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Now this one always surprised me about Uh, Jonah, because he didn't seem to have a whole lot of care for other people until it came to this. Um, For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. Jonah, I don't know if he was sincere when he did that and he didn't think those guys would actually throw him into the sea when he said, you know, guys, just take me and throw me and maybe that'll stop. But when they actually decided to pick him up and throw him overboard, I wonder what he was thinking. What did, what was I thinking when I said that? They think I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the thing that stops the storm, you know, and and you know, what a dumb thing I did. I, I just would love to been inside his head to see what he was thinking when they got ready to do that. <clears throat> Jonah does a good job when the other sailors ask here in Jonah 1.11, what shall we do to you? Jonah's response tells us a lot about Jonah's heart, I believe. He tells the men to throw him into the sea. He's actually sacrificing his own life, thinking that if I'm not on the boat anymore, maybe the storm stops, these guys will be okay, they won't won't drown. Um, And they ask him, what shall we do with you? And he tells them. And you got to give him credit for that. Um, Jonah was, he said, throw me into the sea. He's willing to sacrifice for the others. But the other sailors continued to row hard. In uh, chapter 1, verse 13, it tells us the other guys who were there, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land. 
But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. This group of guys must have been a, I I don't know. I don't know what their belief was. I don't know any of that. But they didn't want to throw Jonah into the water. They kept rowing hard. They didn't just say, okay, he said throw him in. Let's get him over the side of the ship. You know, some people would have gotten excited about that because they would have thought, okay, he said it was going to stop. So let's get him over the edge. But these fellas didn't appear to be those kind of guys. They, uh, <clears throat> they just uh, kept rowing. Um, here in Jonah 1.11, what shall we do to you? Jonah's response in verse 12. He tells them, um, and it tells them a lot about, it tells us a lot about Jonah's heart. He tells these men to throw him into the sea. He's willing to sacrifice for the others. Now, that right there is something, you know, we could spend some time on. Uh, I'm not going to tonight, but the, the mindset of a believer should be this. Willing to sacrifice for the other person. Willing to lay down our life for the other person. God tells us that. And it may be a <clears throat> boatload of lost sailors. You know, I, I don't know. If these guys, um, you know, he was willing to lay down his life. He, he knew, he seemed to know, if you'll just throw me in, the, the storm will stop. Now, I don't know if that meant that he thought if the storm stopped, he'd be able to swim in it, get back to the boat. Uh, I don't know, because I, I don't know Jonah's thinking well enough. Uh, but he tells the men to throw him into the sea. He's willing to sacrifice for the others. But the other sailors continued to row hard. There were some guys there that didn't want to throw him over the edge. And they (coughs) kept rowing hard uh, there in verse 13. (coughs) Jonah in 114, these sailors having seen and heard this testimony from Jonah, bearing in mind these are Uh, In all likelihood, they are lost sailors. And yet here in Jonah 1, 13 and 14, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood for For you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Then we come to the famous story in 9 through 16 of Jonah. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. So what's that telling us? God told that fish, get down there by that boat. Uh, There's going to, you know, there's going to be a guy they're going to throw over the edge and I want you to swallow him. Now, that fish, obviously, I don't know that God told him that. But that fish was in the place God wanted him to be when Jonah was thrown over the edge of the boat. And that fish did what God wanted that fish to do. Because Jonah needed to end up inside the belly of a fish for a while. That is unimaginable for me. The the smell, oh my goodness, just the smell would have killed me. All those rotten fish down there, I mean, that, that big fish. He's been eating fish all day long. They're dead. They've been laying down there in his belly. It has to be just an awful, awful place to be standing at that particular moment. Um, Bearing in mind there are, these are most likely lost sailors, and yet you could almost wonder if this willingness to do what they could Uh, To not have to throw Jonah into the sea indicates a change in the hearts of these men. They, these sailors, verse 14, Jonah 1, call on the name of the Lord. 
Now, I mean, it appears that some of them, either they were taking it from someone they had already seen, or maybe there were believers on this boat. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, or they may just have wanted not to die and lay not on us innocent blood. It's interesting how people who are not really avid prayers, when they get to that place where it's a matter of life and death, what are they doing? They're praying. Uh, most people are. Now there is the occasional person who just is mad, and they're so angry, they're not going to ask anybody for anything. But a lot of people, when they come to that place in life where... Um, you know, they're in a tough spot. And that may have been what's going on with these sailors. But I don't know if it in indicates a change in heart of these men or they just afraid that they're going to they're gonna die and so they'd uh, rather get Jonah and let him be thrown over the side of the ship. Uh, because he had suggested that and so the guys might have thought there would be something to that. Um, but they, these, sla these soldiers, I'm soldiers, sailors, uh, call on the name of the Lord. That's another interesting thing. I don't know if there were believers in the bunch or they'd seen Jonah doing that or some of the other guys on the ship were praying. Jonah, following the prayer of these sailors, Jonah 1, 15 and 16, who as <clears throat> Jonah 1, 15 tells us, 15 and 16, um, as it says, so they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. See, when they, when they threw him in there, I don't think there was a lot of belief there, because suddenly the men feared the Lord exceedingly. When they saw, they threw Jonah over the edge of that boat, and then there was a big fish waiting on him, and he swallowed him. That's, um, I mean, it, it would probably straighten out a lot of us. You know, if we were talking about that and we threw somebody overboard and a big fish swam up and, you know, bloop, and then took off down under the water, we'd probably all be kind of, you know, freaking out over something like that. Uh, and they offered, but they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Um, swimming around in a bunch of slop. The fish was eating, and then it was going through him like it runs through them, and he probably chewed up some of it and then swallowed it, and it's still laying there, and it stinks. And, and so uh, Jonah is getting a wonderful experience here as he's sitting in this fish, um, Jonah, following the prayer of these soldiers, who, as Jonah tells us, um, these soldiers are, they've prayed, they're exceedingly afraid. Uh, what is this that you have done? The men were asking him, for the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Uh, he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea. They did. The fish swallows him. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew worse and more tempestuous against them. This is something that God's in charge of. And um, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It happens all the way through Scripture. Those of us who read Scripture are probably not as impressed with it as we should be. Because we read, you know, this story of Jonah, I've read so many times. I, I've, I've heard it when I was growing up in Sunday school. This was one of the favorite that came around every three or four weeks. And they would tell you the story of Jonah. <clears throat> and so I, I was you know, perfectly okay with the fact that it was a true story. I, I believe this happened. I know it happened. Even when I was little, I mean, it was something that I sometimes would ask my parents about it. You know, he, he swallowed uh, fish swallowed Jonah? You know, because it's kind of hard to imagine as a little guy. They would say, well, sure he did. That's what God sent the fish there to do. Uh, the men kept rowing hard um, back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out 
to the Lord. They're, they're calling out to the Lord. Now, I don't know if it's because they, some of them believe or um, they just perhaps see Jonah doing it and think it might be a good thing to do. Uh, but they ask, they say, Lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they're saying, you're the one that got us into this mess. So they picked up Jonah and <clears throat> hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the, mere, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Many times if you read Scripture, when God does his thing, the... the um, people that are not believers who are standing around, they just get absolutely, I mean, wide-eyed. You know, they, they don't know that God can do these things, and he does these things in front of them. That was one of these. Um, the large fish came, he swallowed Jonah, and he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Uh, I guess you can live in there. Jonah obviously did. I know there's people who have done studies on that. I don't know what they came up with. But apparently he lived there three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. It must have been, however, I, I'm quite the experience uh, being in that big fish because the fish just swimming around. The storm doesn't bother the fish. He can go down deep or he can come up, get his air. Um, <clears throat> then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. That sounds like it was quite the ride. O oh Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed to pray. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This guy, in the belly of that fish, I think he had a conversion experience. Uh, I'm fairly certain. Uh, if it didn't happen then, it happened when he got spit out on the dry land. Um, you know, th this is just an amazing thing. Uh, this will get Jonah turned around going the right direction, I believe. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, was sacrificed to you what I have vowed to pray. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish again. This is the, the nasty part of this story. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. He didn't come out clean. Uh, and he, but he was close to the sea, so he could jump back in and wash it all off before he had to go home. <clears throat> this is one of those stories. How many of you are familiar with this story? Most everybody in the place is familiar with the story, yeah. Um, <clears throat> What do you suppose is God's purpose for this story? If you look at it, there are a number of things you could probably say. Um, well, you know, it shows us that um, God's in charge of the fish. It does. It shows us that, but I don't think that's the you know, thing that God's getting at the most. I mean, he's in charge of everything. Most of us know that. Um, what God can do with the fish, what he can do with his child, as far as getting him to see the truth, I don't, I, I have a, a pretty healthy fear of God. I, I, just, I just do. I've grown up all my life seeing what he can do in Scripture. I don't want to be in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, not much of a chance that I could find a fish around here big enough to eat me and, you know, put me in his belly. But it doesn't have to be a fish, understand. 
If God wants to get our attention because we're not paying attention, be careful. If you're not paying attention, Jonah ended up in the belly of a whale or a big fish. It wasn't a whale, didn't say it was a whale, it's a big fish. Uh, for, because he wasn't doing the right thing. He was trying to get away from God. Have you ever done that? That's a, that's a dangerous thing to do uh, because you're um, making yourself vulnerable to uh, the enemy, quite honestly. And he can do an awful lot of damage to the person who wants to get away from God. But God, when he um, doesn't want that to happen, he can stop it just like that. You can have the fish swim up to the land and spit you out. Uh, but the word there that he uses is he was vomited out upon the dry land. That's another thing I don't want to have happen. <clears throat> is be vomited out of a fish's belly and the vomit come out with me. Um, God, I think, is intent on showing us that this is uh, the wrong place to be. You don't want to go here. It's not pleasant. <clears throat> Jonah could have done, he could have done this absolutely different. He could have done what God told him to do. And it would maybe have turned out just phenomenal if he had just done that. Gone on down to that city begin to proclaim the gospel to those people. But instead, he ran. Um, I think sometimes we need to consider personally whenever we see these stories in Scripture. Do you suppose God wants us doing something similar to what he told Jonah to do? We have a big town here. A ah, huge town, just Levine itself, when you start talking to people, just when, when, um, <clears throat> when we go out and maybe knock on a door and talk to somebody, um, there are a lot of people in our neighborhoods who don't, and I just say this from when, when uh, we were doing that uh, going. Um, going out and knocking on doors, a lot of people didn't appear to know the Lord. They're all around us. Uh, if you go through these neighborhoods a lot on Sunday morning, you'll find a lot of people, they're either still asleep or they're outside washing their car or they're, they don't look like they're getting ready to go to church. And, and that's, I understand that. If you're lost, you have no interest in the church down there. But what should that tell us about what our responsibility is? If we have lost people all around us, then what should we be doing? Seems like a pretty easy answer there. If you read your Bible at all, that's a pretty easy answer. Whose responsibility is it to tell our neighborhoods about the Lord? It was like about five of you knew what it was. Um, it wasn't an enthusiastic response. It's ours! Huh? Um, we, we know it's ours. If you spend any time in Scripture, you know it's our responsibility. That lost neighbor that we live next to. Whose responsibility? One day, guys, we're going to be standing before the Lord. He, he's got it all written out. You understand that? There's going to be a, a judgment when we get there. We will stand before him. Um, we need to think about what kind of questions we want him asking us. Did you have a good time when that guy got saved that you went to see on that street over there, a couple of streets over from your house? See, that's what we want to kind of have that conversation with God as opposed to, why? And I don't know what he's going to ask me. But I don't want to be in a situation where he's going to ask me a question that I don't want to answer. Because, you know, you can't fudge up there. 
you, you got to tell the truth because he'll know whether you're telling the truth or not. Um, I do think that should affect us. Do you think? We're going to stand before the Lord. He knows all of it. He knows every thought you ever had. We're going to get, he's going to talk to us about those things when we get there. No danger of losing your salvation. Don't get nervous about that. You can't do that. If you're truly a believer, um, then, then you'll be okay as far as you, you, don't, you can't lose your salvation. <clears throat> but I, I don't want to stand before God not being able to answer the questions that he has or not wanting to answer the way I know it's truthful to answer. It's going to all be laid bare up there. You know, there's not going to be any of this stuff where we, um, we act like a Christian when we're around people. But then when we're not around people, what do we act like? Now, some of you still act like a Christian, which is a great thing. Some not so much. Probably. Now, in this size of group, you're Sunday evening Christians, so you probably, you know, most of you probably get it done pretty well. No, I, I just, that's a joke. Don't tell the other people I said that. Uh, <clears throat> they might get upset with me. But, but what, what I'm saying is, guys, we want to do this right. So if there are in our neighborhoods a lot of lost people that are going to die one day, what should we be doing? It's hard to get an answer. You know why it's hard to get an answer sometimes? Because we don't want to say it. Because then we might be responsible for it if we say it in front of a bunch of people. We ought to be visiting our neighbors. Even if it's simply taking a handful of tracks walking around our neighborhood, knocking on a door, introducing ourselves, and then saying, uh, do, do you have a church? That's always a great way to start. It's a very easy question. Do you have a church? Do you go to church? Yes, I do. Well, where do you go to church? Well, if they go to a church that preaches the gospel, tell them, well, good, I'm glad. That's a, I'm, I'm just out, you know, just asking people if they don't have a church, they could come visit us. I don't, I don't try to get people who are already going to a church, if it's a good church, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to get them to come over here. They're going over there. Uh, that's where God wants them. They, they believe that, so I want them to stay there. But, but, but then you run into the person. You will run into the person after not too many houses who will not be a believer and does not go to church. And what can we do? What can we do? We have a lot of these people in our neighborhoods. What can we do? JT, what do we do? Yeah. Okay, now that, that's a good answer right there. Did you hear that answer? Uh, that's what, why aren't we doing that? Did somebody tell you about Jesus Christ? Did you just come upon it one day? The light bulb went on and you knew about it. No, somebody had to tell you, whether it was a preacher in a pulpit, whether it was your neighbor, whether it was uh, your mom, your dad, somebody had to tell you about Jesus Christ. And as a result of them telling you, you now are in possession of the greatest gift that's ever been given to anybody. And that is salvation. You, you got that because somebody took the time to tell you about Jesus Christ. Is it right for Christians then, at that point, to take it, stuff it down in our pocket, and just walk around and keep it to ourselves? It's not. And we run into people all the time. I, I keep saying, grab a handful of tracks out there. Just take them with you. If you have that person, you, if you don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel with them, um, share the track with them. 
Oh, well, yeah, got to pray about it. You always pray about it. You don't go do it without praying about it. That's a bad idea. Uh, need to pray about it. But, but we, the, the thing is, we need to start doing it. Okay? I'm not getting after you guys. I'm as guilty as the next person of not taking opportunities that I have at times to share the gospel. Everyone in this place probably that's happened to one time or another. But would I be right in supposing that? Yes, we miss those opportunities from time to time. But, but what are we going to do? We've talked about this before, and I don't know that we're rushing out to do it. Um, but let me encourage you this week. Pray about it. Talk to God about it. If you're kind of nervous about it, um, call me. I'd love to go with you. Um, we need to be doing this in our neighborhood. Those people are our responsibility. God planted us here for a reason. Not so we could be a bunch of happy Christians all together here and the unsaved people stay out there. That's not how God designed this. He wants us to be happy Christians. You know, he wants us to fellowship. He wants us to love one another. But we also need to love the lost people in our neighborhoods. So think about it. Pray about it this week. See if God doesn't lay on your heart somebody that you can either give them a track, share the gospel with them, but don't just walk past them. That's what we're doing, I'm afraid most of the time, is walking past unsaved people. Um, we're not stopping. We're not talking. We're not sharing. We're walking past them way too often. Sometimes God gives us just the ideal setting. He gives us one that we go, oh my goodness, this person, I get to talk with them for a while. They want to be here. And uh, I, I love it when I get that opportunity. Um, but are we willing to go out and look for the people who may, they may slam a door in your face. We say, no, I don't want you around here. I, I personally, one time, um, have had that happen here in Levine. Just don't, no interest. I don't want to know, so go away. Which, so okay, I didn't, I didn't get upset about that. I, I, I don't know. I, if somebody wants to turn, turn me away and say, get out of here, I say, well, sure, yeah, I'll go. Uh, I was trying to live my tracks. I mean, they can read about it, and they, they would know about it at least. But, but folks, we need to be doing that. Each one of us has our sphere of, of uh, you know, opportunity around us. Talk to your neighbor over the fence. Do you know if your neighbor's a believer? I've got one over the fence that's not, and I haven't shared the gospel with him yet. Uh, but I need to. We need to stop saying we've got that and we're not doing it. Uh, we need to be saying, I know where that lost person is I need to share with, and I'm going to go share with them. Take a couple of tracks. If all you get to do is give them a track, give them a track. They'll look at it. The majority of people will open it and they will look through it and say, oh, this is, you know, that's interesting. Maybe they say that's interesting. Maybe they come back and ask you to explain a little more to them. But we need to be doing. From, from Monday to Saturday is not time off from doing God's work. Every day is an opportunity to do God's work. It's just whether or not we're going to do it. Sometimes we as Christians take most of the week off and then we come Sunday for us. Agreed? Come on, we're in church. We've got to agree with that one. Many times that's what we do. How many people did you talk to last week? Does anybody want to... Write that down, let the rest of the church look at it. That's what just happened right there when, when we were having that response. Uh, 
Folks, there are people out there that we need to be talking to. And so let me encourage you. Go home, pray about it. Be sensitive to what God wants you to do this week about that. It, it's really not that hard. We really don't have an excuse for why we're not doing it. I've never had anybody throw anything at me, yell at me. One guy, it's the only time, he just said, no, I, I'm not interested. Um, in a sense, go away. Okay. I, I, can, I didn't cry. Um, I felt sorry for the man when I walked away. Um, Caesar was with me, and I told him when we were walking away, I said, uh, not Caesar, Adrian, thank you. Adrian was with me, and we were walking away. I said, I feel sorry for that guy. Because he may never have anybody else come to his door. He may die next week without the Lord. That's a sad thing. Uh, but when they tell me, go away, when that man said, go away, I don't want to talk to you, I said, okay, thank you, sir. Would you like me to leave you a track? No, I don't want a track either. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll go on down the road. And uh, I felt sorry for him too. But there's only so much you know, that we get to do. But I would encourage you, we need to be doing. One day we will stand before the Lord. He has told us. We've been told to share the gospel. Are we doing it? Uh, if God was here with us, if Jesus was standing here and he says, I want to walk with you this week. It's what he does, you know that. I want to walk with you this week. But you could see and hear him right there. He's telling us that. He said, we're going to hit the neighborhood this week. What would your response to him be? Ah, I don't know if I got time. You think you'd answer him that way? Uh, if you did come and visit me after church, I don't think a Christian would, I would think we would be excited about that. Him going, with, or us getting to go with him to go do that. But see, that's where he's at. He's there. He goes with us. I always pray before I go somewhere to share the gospel. God, I, you're going to have to be there. He's got to do the work in that person's heart in order for that person to respond. But he wants us talking to those people about what they need. Because some of them literally don't know how to become a Christian. They haven't got a clue. But we need to be telling them. So let me encourage you. Pray. See who God lets you run into this week. If you ask him for somebody, get ready. Because he's liable to bring them to your door. You know, those pesky people who come to doors and try to get you to do this or that. It's kind of like us when we go to the store, but, I mean to the door. But we're, we're there for a good reason. When the Jehovah's Witness comes to my door, I want to talk to those folks they don't come to our doors anymore. I've tried to witness to them, and they don't come back. So if you don't like them coming, witness to them. But you can do something good for them if you do that. But um, then we'll talk about it next Sunday evening. You can, you, we can have a conversation about how many people we got to see this week, right? I, I'm not going to do that. No, there wouldn't be anybody here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that because then that's. Hey, that's we got to go talk about what we did this week. I forgot. So I think I'm gonna stay home. <laughs> you know, I I don't know. I don't think you guys would do that, but we really need to do that, guys. It's our responsibility. God has given us that task, and we need to start doing it. I know some of you are, but we need to do it better. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love for us. You. You are such a patient God with us, God. We know that. You tell us to do things at times. We, we don't get them done the way we should. God, I would just pray that you will help us to recognize just how important it is for these folks who do not know you. Uh, God, for us to, to go and have a conversation with them. 
we don't save them, we just give them the information on how they can know you. And God, I, I pray that you will lay that on our hearts, that we might be able to see people in our, um, in our uh, section of this city coming to know you. But Christians are going to have to go share with some of those people because they don't go to church. They, they don't, some of them even have a Bible. They don't know you. And so God, help us. Give us a burden for uh, talking with these people. And we thank you for what you'll do. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, go ahead. Amen. Join us by singing this song, My God is for you. Amen. There are some things I may not know there are some places I can go but I am sure of this one thing for I can feel him and be within my God is real real in my soul my God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Some folks may doubt, some folks may scorn. All can desert and leave me alone. But as for me, I'll take us far. For God is real and I can feel him in my heart. My God is real, real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. For I can feel him in my soul. Oh, my bad. I can tell. When Jesus took your sins away, but since that day, yes, since that hour, for his holy power, my God is real, my God is real, real in my soul. My God is real, for he has washed and made me whole. For me, it's like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. God bless you.